The College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University has named its Alumni Fellow for 2017, a familiar name to the university and to the field of animal biosecurity. He's a 1972 graduate of the college and went on to a career with the Army Veterinary Corps, after which he returned to Kansas State University and served in an important capacity at this institution. Dr. Jerry Jacks is his name, and Jerry, first of all, congratulations on this well-deserved recognition. Thank you, Eric. Let's talk about how you arrived at K-State. You originally are from South Central Kansas, right? That's right. Yeah, I grew up in Conway Springs, and uh, I actually, you know, this is, uh, this is heinous, but I went, I went to KU. I was a walk-on on their basketball team uh, in the mid-60s. And uh, after I figured out that I wasn't going to be much of a basketball player as far as a career is concerned, I decided to go to veterinary school. So I had an older brother who was a veterinarian, uh, graduated in 61. And uh, so I came down here and uh, uh, got accepted to veterinary school and uh, graduated in uh, 1972. So what were your early aspirations? In large animal practice or something else? What? You know, I... I I, I suspected my brother is a mixed practice uh, practitioner, and I mean, he's really, you know, got the old stereotypical country doc uh, life. Um, and I probably was leaning towards small animal practice, but I didn't really have a, uh, uh, I think I'm like a lot of people that go to vet school, like you just sort of go on, we'll see what happens. And, uh, you know, I think much of my career has been, um, Let's see what opportunities are out there and uh, not to have, you know, your stick driven too far into the ground that you can't change course if you need to. As you reflect back on your time at the vet med school at K-State, who do you think of as inspirations or guiding lights, if you will? Well, um, I think the person, uh, actually there are two people that I think about most when we talk about uh, the college here, Dan Upson and Russ Fry, and you know, for people that are, you know, that go back into that era, I think they were, you know, they were really the face of the faculty in a lot of ways for people in my class. Um, and years later, when we would come back to alumni uh, functions, uh, Dr. Upson and Fry, uh, you know, they really carried the banner for the school in a tremendous way. They were, you know, they, they, they were obviously excellent teachers, but they were great people too who, uh, uh, you know, who really took the time to interact and get to know, uh, get to know their students. So you completed your DVM in 1972. Where did you go from there? Is that the point at which you embarked on your career with the Army Veterinary Corps? It is, but I think I have to go back into uh, my college career to uh, to get there. Okay. Um, so I got married the year before my senior year and as luck would have it I married someone who was a year behind me in veterinary school. Um, that doesn't sound like such a big deal now but in, the, in, in those days it was uh, it was unusual. There were 80 people in my class we had two women. So it was a lot different, uh, a <laughs> lot different environment certainly uh, than it is now. So I had a so I had a professional spouse following me a year uh, you know, into my, uh, an, after my graduation. So, you know, you look around and there weren't a whole lot of job opportunities here close by uh, to work while your spouse finished up. Well, in 1972, the Vietnam War was gone and they were hiring in a big way. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe 33 of my classmates out of 80 went into the service, either into the Army or the uh, Air Force Veterinary Corps. Now it wasn't that uh, you know any of us, and I think back of, to all of them, I don't think any of us were uh, uh, flaming patriots, uh, but uh, the draft was going and they had a thing called early commissioning uh, in those days and I think that they still have a form of that uh, now, but if you signed up for the service while you were in school, it protected you from being drafted. And so instead of going in as a potential, uh, you know, uh, infantryman, 
uh, you could become commissioned as a veterinary corps officer at the end of the, at, at the end of the time. I didn't sign up for that because I really wasn't interested. I didn't have any real connection, family connection to uh, to the service. Uh, but when I got down towards the end and I'd gotten married and uh, it complicated my you know, my professional situation, uh, one of my friends uh, who was going to the Army said, well, why don't you join the Army, man? I, they'll assign you to Fort Riley right over here. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound so bad. So I called up the, I called up the personnel office at the Army Veterinary Corps, and, and they said, well, you know, uh, if you'll, uh, you know, if you will sign up, we'll assign you to Fort Riley. And so that's what I did. I... Uh, uh, I joined the Army and was assigned to Fort Riley, and so uh, for the year my wife was here finishing up, uh, we were, you know, I was in the Army, and actually one of my other classmates was out there with me, so, and, and it was, you know, it was kind of fun. We, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. We did a lot of horse work and uh, uh, had a small animal clinic. Uh, so when my wife graduated, we ran into exactly the same reverse situation. Here we were, I was, I was tied to Fort Riley because I had another year on my commitment and she was graduating, and uh, uh, so I thought, well, you know, and she said, well, maybe they'll sign us someplace together and I'll join the Army too. And so we talked about that and thought about it and, and called up the uh, uh, career office and uh, they gave us four or five places that uh, we would get, that they would station us together. And I didn't know at the time that we were only, uh, we would be the second couple in the history of the Army Veterinary Corps and she would be the second per, she would be the second woman oh. in the whole, in the in the history of the veterinary corps so uh, we went to Fort Lewis and uh, we spent two years there uh, and uh, she ran a clinic and I did uh, other stuff on the on the uh, on the post and of course those posts were humming in those days that was a big departure point for folks going to Vietnam uh, and at the end of that two year commitment that she had um, they called us and wanted, when our, when it was, would be time for us to uh, separate, uh, wanted to know if we wanted to go to uh, Europe together. Hmm. And so, uh, we said, Hey, that sounds like, you know, that sounds like fun. And so we went to, uh, uh, we went to Germany and we were assigned together there. We, we, uh, planned to, you know, do a lot of sightseeing and skiing and all the stuff that you do, uh, you know, when you're, when you're young and, uh, and, uh, have a lot of energy, uh, and we had some interesting things happen to us there. Uh, well, we had two children, so forget the sightseeing <laughs> and forget the skiing. New agenda. <laughs> yeah, and and actually, we, uh, you know, we we were part of a. There were three veterinarians where we were. One of them was a colonel, and we were two captains. And of course, we had a big. Uh, uh, we had a big mission with military working dogs, about a, you know, about a, between 140 and 150 military working dogs. And these working dogs were protecting nuclear, tactical nu nuclear uh, ammo dumps. Mm -hmm. And so they were very, very, very valuable dogs and required the best of veterinary care. So, you know, my wife uh, probably took more, did more of that work than I did. But uh, uh, anyway, the reason it's important is because we were on call all the time. So we essentially, you know, our, our traveling was very curtailed by what we did, but we really enjoyed it. Uh, we were involved in some interesting uh, projects while we were there and we liked it. And after our three years, we came back, uh, uh, we, we came back to uh, uh, the States and wrangled an assignment at Leavenworth with an intention of getting out of the, getting out of the service and, you know, going back to uh, South Central Kansas someplace. Mm -hmm. But you but, ended up... <laughs> yeah, but uh, we got called from the, uh, uh, from the career office and they wanted to know if we were interested in postgraduate uh, training programs. Uh, the Army has uh, uh, some of the finest postgraduate training for veterinarians in the world. Uh, and, you know, we thought about it a little bit, and uh, they wanted to know if we might be interested in a pathology and a laboratory animal medicine residency. And so we drove back at, at, to Frederick, Maryland, where Fort Dietrich is, and uh, Frederick was beautiful. 
uh, there were a lot of veterinarians that were assigned. There were 25 veterinarians assigned to the institute where we would, uh, uh, where we would train. Uh, those are good specialties. They're, you know, they're, uh, the kind of training that we did, where it was four years of, uh, of training, but we were actually on the job and uh, uh, very satisfying. And we worked at, uh, we worked at USAMRID, which is the Army's Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases where they look for ways to counter bioterrorism. And so uh, their claim to fame and their, uh, uh, their really unique capability is to be able to work with uh, uh, the worst of the bio biological agents, anthrax, Ebola, Marburg, Hunin, uh, the Western and the, equi uh, the equine encephalitides. And if, if it sounds bad, we had it there uh, because uh, people were really concerned about uh, the use of biological weapons on the battlefield. Uh, it wasn't so well known then, except in uh, classified uh, settings, uh, but there were people here that knew about the, the huge uh, offensive BW program that the, uh, that the Soviets had. And so uh, we went to work there. And uh, both of us uh, trained in our specialties, and at the end of the at the end of our four years, uh, she boarded in path, and I boarded in lab animal, and uh, were were then assigned to the Institute for Chemical Defense, which is about a hundred miles away, uh, on Chesapeake Bay, once again in Maryland, and we went down there uh, as uh, more in the management side of. Uh, of the house, we got promoted to major, both of us, uh, and we went down there and uh, worked in chemical defense. And you know, it's, it's sort of interesting that uh, uh, one of the agents that we did work on, looking for again to try to develop countermeasures, was sarin, which is, of course has been in the news in uh, in uh, Syria. Uh, and we were looking for, you know, it's a, that that is a uh, a non-persistent nerve agent. You get just a couple drops on your skin, and it could prove fatal. So it's a, it's nasty stuff. Something that was weaponized by uh, numerous countries, and that's where this stuff is coming from from uh, uh, existing weapon stockpiles. Uh, so uh, we spent five years there, which was uh, very very uh, uh, enjoyable, uh, and then uh, they decided to move us back to uh, USAMRID. And by the time we went back there, we were uh, we went back as uh, we'd gotten promoted to lieutenant colonel together. And right before we went back to USAMR, we were both selected for full colonel. So that is, you know, if I look, if, if, in my personal opinion, if I look back on, you know, what was the high point of our career, it was both of us getting selected to be. Uh, to make colonel at the same time. She was only the second female colonel in the Army. We were the first ones to make colonel together. Um, and I don't think it's been duplicated, even in the last 30 years, but one other couple. And I don't think they were married when they got into the service. They got married in the service. So anyway, that, that was a real accomplishment. And we went back to USAMRID um, as the directors of our uh, of our groups and our training program. And so when we got back, the, you know, within a month of getting back to USAMR the second time, uh, we had a very uh, significant uh, event happen there, and that, that was the uh, Ebola outbreak uh, in late 1889 and into 1990. And that involved a, a, a group of monkeys that was imported into the United States, uh, part of a uh, uh, they were imported for research, but it was a privately owned quarantine facility where, and ironically, uh, Ebola, ironically, those quarantine regulations had been put into effect because of another filovirus, which Ebola and Marburg are, the, are two filoviruses, are the two filoviruses. A Marburg outbreak in uh, Germany in 1966 that killed 25 people working in a, uh, working in a vaccine production laboratory. Uh, Nobody could figure out what it was. Had you know, six, that one had uh, sixty or uh, twenty-five percent mortality for people affected, and so they implemented these 
quarantine regulations so that when you imported monkeys, you didn't import something that was sick that would perhaps spread. So uh, these monkeys broke with, with Ebola while they were in quarantine. Uh, they thought it was a, a simian hemorrhagic fever, which is a very uh, pathogenic and deadly uh, monkey disease, but is not zoonotic, so it doesn't affect humans. And, uh, but it wasn't. They sent tissues up to us, and it, was, it, it wasn't just SHF, it was Ebola too. And of course, Ebola had never been seen outside of Africa. Uh, in the outbreaks that we knew about, uh, this particular strain, uh, Ebola Zaire, had shown 90% mortality in people. There was no countermeasure to it. There was no treatment, no, uh, no anything other than using uh, PPE. Uh, and so uh, it was a real emergency. It was an international emergency within the infectious disease community. Um, by blind luck, it happened within about 50 miles of, of our institute, uh, which housed uh, the greatest concentration of uh, expertise for working with high hazard pathogens. And so um, we deployed down there on an emergency basis. The, you know, the interesting thing about this is that nobody knew how to do it. There was nobody that had the mission to, you know, to respond. You know, first responders now, we talk about first responders a lot. Well, a lot of that came out of uh, what happened in the 90s and into uh, 2000 with 2001 because they were having these emergencies. Well, the Ebola outbreak was one of the first big ones that really uh, got everybody concerned about, well, what do we do if something happens? So you do improvise to so a certain we had, extent? Yeah, we improvised and we, you know, uh, we. We improvised using equipment that was designed for something completely, uh, you know, completely novel to the kinds of things that we were going to do, not designed for heavy duty work associated with working in a contaminated uh, uh, monkey facility. And so uh, that was, uh, you know, that was, that was a very interesting episode that uh, uh, when we got down towards the end of it, they, in, in the laboratory, uh, they did more work on this, particular, on this particular virus, and it turns out that the one that was affecting these monkeys was a different strain. It was Ebola, not Ebola Zaire, but they named it Ebola Restin. A monkey pathogen that killed monkeys with a hemorrhagic disease, like the hemorrhagic diseases that affect humans, but, not zo uh, but apparently not zoonotic to people. So, uh, it created a big ripple within the infectious disease community. Uh, there were lots of mysteries about it, just like the rest of the filoviruses, but uh, it burned out and it disappeared and nobody really knew that much more about it. And so, and so uh, like I say, it, it, was, it, it was a very noteworthy thing within our community. Well, two or three years later, uh, Richard Preston, who is, a free, who is a freelance writer for, uh, uh, for The New Yorker, uh, he, he heard about this, and actually it's an interesting story how he, uh, how he got onto this. We never knew this, although we interacted with Preston a lot while he was writing uh, his stuff. Uh, but he was, he's a Ph.D. English major, actually, uh, and, he, and, he decided, and he, went to a, uh, uh, he went to a lecture at, uh, at Yale, and uh, Josh Letterberg, who is a Nobel laureate uh, in biology, gave a talk and it essentially was how vulnerable we are to biologic, uh, you know, to biologic outbreaks or even attack. And in his talk, he said, yeah, if you want to really know just how bad it could be or how close we, you know, how close we can come, all you have to do is think about the rest of Ebola outbreak. Uh, down in Frederick, Maryland, uh, at Fort Detrick, and then he went on to something else. And and Richard Richard Preston uh, took out a card and he wrote down Fort Detrick, Ebola, uh, and latched onto that then basically, and and put it in you know <laughs> put it into his coat pocket. What, he, actually, I heard this story on Charlie Rose. He was being interviewed by Charlie Rose after he'd uh, written his book, and he said. 
So six months later, I put on the same jacket and I pulled this card out because he'd forgotten about it. And he went, oh, you know, I wanted to follow up on that. So, so he did, he came down to Fort Detrick and, uh, and he said, uh, and again, this is all stuff that we had heard for the first time when he was talking about it on Charlie Rose. And he said, uh, so I went to their PR people uh, at the post and they said, they, he said, I want to talk to somebody about the monkey thing. And they said, so they called over to me and they said, we got some guy over here that wants to talk about the, the, the rest of the, or the Ebola outbreak. And I went, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> you know, you know, red flags went yeah, up. <laughs> yeah, red flags went up. You know, a, you know, a guy from the New Yorker wants to talk about, you know, where we killed 500 monkeys. And uh, so I talked to our PR people and they said, well, you know, he seems, you know, he seems like a reasonable guy and, you know, talk to him and see what he has to say. So he came over, he, so he came over to my office at, uh, at USAMRIT at the, at the Institute. And we were sitting there and about five minutes after he came, Nancy came walking in. She would come down, we worked in the same building, she worked in a different department, but she came down, I don't know, four or five times a day when she'd take a break, she'd walk down. And she came in and uh, she sat down and he started and, and so essentially we talked to him for an hour or so. Uh, he said on Charlie Rose, he said, well, he said, then Nancy Jacks walked in and he said, in about three or four minutes, I knew there was a good story there. He said, I didn't know what it was, but I knew there was, uh, you know, something right. So anyway, he wrote, he wrote a, an, an article called Crisis in the Hot Zone, which was uh, in, in the New Yorker, about a 25 page uh, article. And that created a crazy uh, uh, activity within the uh, uh, within the public affairs uh, within the public affairs group, and then uh, then he wrote the Hot Zone, which was a uh, a full book, and uh, to say that really changed our business is a, you know is is an understatement. Uh, that was that was the fortieth best selling book of the entire decade of the nineties, which is pretty remarkable for a nonfiction book about, you know, about a virus. And so uh, we got, you know, we got a lot of legs out of that. You know, it was, that, that was, uh, uh, that was exposure and advertisement that, you know, you can't personally buy, that's for sure. And the army can't buy it either. And so the army was very, you know, was very forthcoming with you know, with how it all worked, and so uh, that that really made it good. So he, you know, he made a boatload of money off of it. Uh, spun off a movie that the uh, created a bidding war within uh, uh, within the Hollywood community, and for reasons that uh, you know uh, that would take too long to tell. Uh, the guys that. Uh, the guys made the movie who did not get the rights to the book, so it was a wildly fictionalized version called uh, uh, called Outbreak. So, uh, but that was fun too because Ridley Scott, who uh, you know did Alien and uh, uh, Gladiator, and I think he did Black Hawk Down. I say he, you know, you probably recognize Ridley Scott. Uh, he, he spent, we're told he spent uh, 10 to $12 million of his own money on sets uh, for the hot zone. He was gonna be the, uh, uh, he was gonna be the director, Robert Redford and Jodie Foster were gonna, were, were uh, uh, gonna be in it. So it was, uh, you know, it was a big deal and certainly for, you know, certainly for us, that was, it was a lot of fun uh, interacting uh, within that community. So uh, we continued working at USAMRID uh, uh, up until 1998. And uh, so I was in three, within th uh, three and a half years of, of retirement because you have a mandatory retirement of 30 years unless you get a, a, an exemption from Congress. And uh, you know, my, the whole K-State thing just really uh, happened then. Ron Truen, who is uh, uh, at the time, he was the uh, associate provo vice provost for Vice Provost for Research. Uh, he called me up and said, I'd like to come talk to you. And uh, uh, he showed up at the Institute. He made a trip up, although he comes to Washington a lot, but he made a trip up to Frederick and uh, sat down and he said, uh, you know, would you be interested in 
in coming back to K-State. Because that was the point at which K-State was starting to make a, a true investment in biosecurity yeah, research. Yeah, and I, I would have to say Ron Truen was the heart and soul of that. You know, I think that he had the support of uh, the senior administration, certainly uh, President Weefall uh, and Bob Krause, I think, was a, you know, was a big pusher of it. But Ron was really the guy who had the baton. Uh, and I think he was interested in, uh, you know, there were, there were some, uh, there were some issues that were uh, from a c compliance perspective. So laboratory animal medicine, which is what I do, is uh, we do a lot of compliance work. Uh, it is to make sure that all the laws and regulations associated with using animals in research are carefully, are, are carefully followed. And obviously, if you're, if you're using a hundred thousand animals a year, like we were at USAMRID, you're working with the Army, which certainly probably is not the favorite organization of uh, animal rights activists. Now you know ninety-five to ninety-six seven percent of those were mice that we were that we were using, but nonetheless. So compliance is a very important part of uh, port in the portfolio for the stuff that I'd done. Plus, yeah, you know, I guess just to back up, my last uh, my last two years in the service, uh, I worked in biological arms control. So uh, I was the director of an office called BACTO. That, that's the, an acronym, uh, Biological Arms Control Treaty Office. And so uh, my office, and so I was responsible for compliance with all applicable biowarfare treaties and agreements for the for the army and that was uh you know that was a pretty daunting responsibility because the army is a big army uh and we have lots of uh you know we have lots of different entities uh so in that role i got a real chance to uh get an understanding about biowarfare, about the real, the, the offensive side of biowarfare. Working at USAMRID, we were focused on medical defense against biologic agents. And so developing countermeasures, trying to figure out how to make vaccines work, uh, that's one thing. But when you get to the other side of that and you're looking at and you have access to uh, privileged information, uh, you, get a, you, you get to hear uh, more about what it is that we're worried about. Uh, you get to go to countries and get an understanding of their, uh, of their capabilities. And I got a chance to travel to Russia uh, and talk to some of their scientists and learn more about what it is that they were doing. And it is, uh, it really changed my whole view of everything. You had the full picture at that point. Yeah, you had the full picture at that point. That really changed my deal uh, in a lot of ways. So uh, Nancy and I had a lot of, uh, you know, we had a lot of, uh, uh, we had a lot of juice within the infectious disease com community because uh, we had this thing with Ebola that happened. Uh, we were able to put together uh, information that appealed to a lot of people. You know, the thing about Preston's books is, you know, precocious fifth graders could read it, but someone who had a PhD in uh, biochem in, uh, uh, in microbiology would not just go, well, you know, it's just a bunch of crap. <laughs> so, you know, and, and that's, that's something that's not easy to do. Um, but when I, when I got, really got into the offensive side of it, uh, I became much more interested in the threat. Uh, and since I'd been involved in, you know, what was really a very close call from, a, uh, from an emergency response perspective, uh, I could straddle both those, uh, you know, both those fields. And so I started really talking about the threat. And back to your comment about Ron Truen, uh, I think that's where he was coming from. Uh, he was, you know, they, he was thinking about the threat. He and um, you know, I think the senior leadership here. And so, since I'm since I was a K stater, and uh, we had always intended to go back, you know, to come back here, uh, he really reached out to me and and said, 
you know, I, I think, you know, we have, we have a spot for you. And, and, they, and, and as a laboratory animal medicine veterinarian, we had some issues here that really needed, uh, really needed addressing. Uh, the guy who was our laboratory animal veterinarian uh, had an acute heart attack and died, Sam Krukenberg. Uh, and so they really were sort of left in the lurch. And, and you know, and I think, uh, um, you know, I, I think there was some benign neglect as far as what needed to be done here uh, to be a, you know, to be a really first class research university. And so uh, I think Ron was looking at that picture and so he created the, uh, the University Research Compliance Office and he says, you know, we'd like for you to, you know, of course, you know, went through the whole uh, recruitment and, and, you know, I, I mean, they made the job for me. I mean, it was obvious it was because it fit right into the things I wanted to do. Uh, but my portfolio, my portfolio there was uh, uh, compliance-related oversight of all the animal care and use programs on campus, which is pretty big. Uh, the bio, uh, uh, the use of recombinant DNA and biosafety. Although I share, you know, I, I always sort of, I, I always had a. Uh, 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 a, a collaborative relationship with the safety office here on campus in that in that role, uh, and responsible for all research associated with human subjects on campus. And there's a lot of it. You know, if you think about the uh, uh, the folks in social sciences and social anthropology and uh, 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 kinesiology, there's a lot of work goes on that involves human subjects, and of course that in that just like animal care and use has a uh, a moving target that is always uh, that's always being uh, uh, ratcheted up as far as the compliance uh, re and regulation. So uh, had a real you know had a real job on my hands, and it was uh, it was fun. I was by myself essentially. It was a one man office, uh, uh, but. When you're running compliance, what you need is a boss who says, I'm with you. And so a lot of the things that we had to do and a lot of the things that we had to, uh, uh, we, we implemented during, uh, you know, especially during those early years. Uh, Ron was uh, a very big supporter. And another, you know, another really huge piece of this was uh, Ralph Richardson came almost the same week that I got here. Uh, I, had not, I had not known Ralph, although we were pretty close in school. Um, and, and part of that lab animal program, that lab animal program has always, had always resided in the vet school and I wasn't in the vet school. And so, uh, he could have said, well, I'm not, I'm not giving that up. You know, that's part of our, that's part of our deal. Uh, but we worked together and, uh, you know, and, and, and I will, you know, I'll say that, uh, you know, we were in trouble with uh, our accrediting agency. Uh, they had informed us, they, they had informed K-State that they were going to uh, revoke their accreditation for uh, ALAC, which is, the, which is our accrediting body. Uh, I want to say five years later, uh, during a site visit that was, uh, the, with, the out briefing was attended by uh, the president and all of the key players on campus here, uh, site visitor said he'd done 160 or 70 site visits and he'd never seen a better one than this one. Wow. So we really went from, uh, you know, being in the doghouse to, uh, you know, to having a, you know, I, you know, in, I think an outstanding program. In fact, they're just getting ready in, in May, they're having their, their ALAC accreditation visit here. It's once, it one, happens once every three years. So, um, so as far as the, uh, you know, as far as the compliance office, um, I got what I want, you know, I was able to do what I thought was right, which is uh, important because in, you know, in our, in, in my business, uh, dealing with scientists who are, you know, who, who are really smart guys, uh, they don't want to hear you can't do that. Right. They don't want to hear, oh, well, you forgot to fill this out or you forgot to check this box. And, uh, you know, many of them are in the trust me, I'm brilliant mode. 
uh, which is, you know, which is true, but you can't always trust them. You know, sometimes you almost have to save them from themselves. So, uh, so that piece of it was very challenging, but a lot of fun. I mean, it was, it was very rewarding again, because, uh, you know, my boss, uh, my boss had, our, had my back. And uh, so as far as the, uh, uh, the things that Ron really, I think, w was at the heart of his, uh, you know, uh, in his heart was, he obviously as, uh, as the uh, vice provost for research, he wanted to make sure that we didn't have, you know, significant compliance issues. But he really wanted to do something here to change K-State's uh, profile in, uh, you know, in the biomedical community. And this and eventually led to absolutely. the installation of the Biosecurity Research Institute. Absolutely. So he, you know, I, you know, when I got here, he, we start, he, he started talking about, uh, here's what we need to do. And shortly after I was here, we went up to, uh, we went up to Washington and, you know, if you've ever heard Ron talk, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the famous testifying in front of, uh, uh, Congress and and uh, you know about the threat, especially the agricultural threat. Uh, not many people were talking about the agricultural threat in those days, and, and clearly it is a you know it, it is a real one. Just look at the, you know, just look at how seriously the you know the, the government is taking it. Uh, and so yeah, we we ended up um, uh, working the state legislature and and you know our partners here. Uh, and uh, getting the Biosecurity Research Institute, which was a huge, you know, I mean, it was a huge leap to think that it was going to happen. And again, I, you know, I credit Ron and, uh, you know, and, and others, uh, but, I, but I, I think he was really at the heart, at, at the heart of it. Um, and so once we got the, the BRI up and running, uh, it did put us in a different category in a lot of ways. So when the, uh, so when the uh, solicitation for the RFP for the NBAF, what ultimately became the NBAF, Ron said, uh, and others said, well, wow, we ought we to we ought, we ought apply for that. Mm -hmm. And I'll have to tell you, I thought, fat chance. You know, because I just, I just really thought that uh, you know, we wouldn't be competitive. Uh, but as we got, you know, as we got into it more and we really looked at what they wanted, uh, their criteria for success, which is one, they wanted it close to a veterinary school, you know, to be able to interact with it. And I have personal experience with this because uh, I had traveled to Plum Island a number of times. Uh, and it is hard to get there from here, from anywhere. And I think that it created this sense of isolation being out there on the island. Uh, even though people go, wow, it, yeah, why don't we have it on the island? You know, we really like that island thing. Uh, but it creates a sense of isolation because you can't get uh, collaborative scientists, which is, of course is the lifeblood of, 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 of research in most ways. Um, and I think, I mean, if you listen to some of the issues that they had with Plum Island, you know, they're out there working on people, turning them into super soldiers, and, you know, they're creating the Montauk monster. Uh, you know, all of that stuff. But because they're out there, I mean, it's like, what are they doing out there? You know, what, you know they're, they're hiding something yeah, because suspicion. they're out there. Yeah, it raises yeah. suspicion. And so they wanted to have it someplace where it was, you know, much more accessible and could be uh, both uh, uh, good for academics and good for... Uh, uh, and good for the uh, well-being of the, you know, of, of their faculty to be able to attract faculty, uh, and so and you know many people have uh, trailing spouses, you know you and and they want to be able to uh, have uh, uh, academic appointments, you know, in a university. So with all of that, and what I think, you know, it was one of the things that really you know, that really made me think we, you know, we really had a chance. Uh, they had an accident at Texas A&M. So when we were looking across the landscape of, you know, who's going to play, 
you know, who are going to be who are going to be competitors for uh, the NBAF? Well, first of all, George Bush was the president. Texas A and M, which is, uh, you know, a very powerful research university with lots of uh, uh, with uh, you know with with lots of resources, they were doing you know not as you know they did they didn't have the BRI but they were doing work that was uh, with with uh, high consequence pathogens, and they had and they had a uh, an accident right in the critical phase of making the proposals, and one of their graduate students got sick, got tularemia, which is a uh, uh, which is a disease that had been thought of as a biowarfare, a potential biowarfare agent. And uh, that created an uproar uh, within, you know, within the, uh, you know, within various communities, and it knocked them out. And so then Texas, again, which was still a very powerful uh, potential, uh, they put together a an application or a, a submission that just didn't answer the mail for a lot of the stuff they did because uh, they couldn't get it close to a vet school and a lot of the stuff that uh, made Texas A and M such a you know for, such a formidable applicant uh, went away and so the thing that really did it for us I think the BRI you know what they wanted to do uh, they, they they wanted to mitigate the uh, uh, the problems they had uh, in the community, and it's easy to say, "Hey, we're going to, you know, Manhattan and Riley County and all the, you know, all the farmers around here uh, are good with the, you know, with us building one of these babies up here." That's easy to say. It's not so easy to do, and I think with us. Uh, when we built the BRI, we really, you know, we went out and talked to anybody who would listen. You know, I don't care. I, I don't care if they were all in wheelchairs. Uh, we would do it. And we did do some of those. Uh, and so we really reached out to the community and we really made the effort to, uh, to show that, uh, that people here were, were signed up for it, that, you know, and, you know, there were people who had questions, but we would stand there and we would answer their questions. And, and you know, you're not going to convince everybody, and there is a, there, there, there's a kernel of people here, uh, you know, that are dead against it, but, uh, you know, you have, to be, you have to be ready to talk to them and, and uh, try to allay their concerns, but it is what it is. And I think, you know, when, uh, uh, when we were talking about this, one of the things that we were able to do is that because of, you know, just the blind luck that we had at UC Amherst with Nancy and I, and with Nancy and me, we could stand there and say, hey, look, you know, we've done this before, you know. We worked for 15 or 20 years in these, in these facilities. We raised kids, you know. You took off your, uh, your gear and you went home every night and nobody, you know, was, you know, never had anybody get sick, never once thought, oh, man. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna kill my kids, or I'm gonna kill my neighbors, because uh, the uh, uh, the equipment works. You know, the the technology that has been developed, uh, you know, that that goes back 35, 40 years, really works. Uh, and uh, the technology in these new buildings, uh, to include the BRI and, and and the NBAF, is the best that's ever been done. Because of course, that technolo new technology is being incorporated all the time. So I think that it really was, uh, uh, I think it was really a positive thing, and we were willing to do it, uh, you know, because I'm a believer. I really believe that, uh, I really believe first there's a need, and this again goes back to my experiences uh, in arms control. Uh, and I think that they're safe, because, you know, we really did a lot of that, and, and you know, my wife, did, you know, what I consider to be one of the most dangerous things that you can do in veterinary medicine, and that's to do uh, complete necropsies on Ebola-infected animals. And that includes taking out the brain, and you don't do that with a, with a butter knife. Uh, you know, it is a sharps, uh, intensive uh, business. 
and you do 15 or 20 of them at a, you know, in a row, and you can't be thinking about, you know, you can't be thinking about the ball game. You've got, you know, so it is, you know, a slip of a knife or a slip of a, uh, of, of a needle and uh, you're along for the ride there. And this is, and this is with the real stuff, you know, the ones that, you know, kill 90% of their patients with no, uh, with no countermeasure. So we had, you know, we, we had, we walked the walk there. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we were fortunate enough to, uh, 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 to get the end bath. Uh, I think, uh, I personally think it's going to have a transformational effect on, on certainly, I think Manhattan, but it will also have a transformational effect on K-States, uh, certainly K-States by a medical stature within the research community. Uh, and if I, you know, if, I guess, you know, I can't claim those as a legacy, but I don't think, you know, if Nancy and I hadn't been here, we wouldn't have the BRI. And if we didn't have the BRI, we wouldn't have the NBAF. Uh, I mean, I, I, don't think we, I, don't, I don't think we were as front and center in the, in the NBAF, but uh, we were there. And a lot of the people that are uh, decision makers have been, uh, uh, you know, they knew us. And, uh, and again, it was just blind luck. It was just one of the things that happened. It was just, uh, you know, but it was a it was a game changer for us, and I think it, uh, you know, good for K State that somebody uh, figured out how to use it, and you know, in what I think is a very positive thing, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy that uh, uh, we were able to do that. Well, great things obviously are happening in the area of agro bioterrorism defense and uh, biosecurity. And as you outlined, Jerry, NBAP is going up rapidly as we speak. It's still a couple of years away, but it will be opening up in uh, just not too long from now. You reflect back on all this and you reflect on this recognition as the alumni fellow for the College of Veterinary Medicine. What does this all signify to you, this particular recognition? You know, uh, I'm giving a talk tomorrow and I'm calling it, you never know what's going to happen. And that is... You know, that's absolutely right. So, you know, my wife was much more of a, you know, I, if you talk to Dr. Upson and Dr. Fry and anybody who is around, and most of them are dead now, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly wasn't a, uh, you know, a top-notch student. Uh, my wife was. And I had to find the right thing. And, you know, we we went, th that, that going to that, you know, that, that uh, uh, that fork in the road that we took to go to USAMRID really changed. You know, it re really changed me because I found something that really, you know, fit me. Um, and so, you know, my my sense of it is is that you should take advantage of uh, of opportunities. And I think that we have taken advantage of opportunities our whole career. And, you know, you really can't talk about one of us without talking about the other because we've been, you know, we have, we have always worked together. We've always had a partnership. Uh, we don't do anything without the others uh, being a part of the planning. And so, you know, who would have thought uh, that I would, uh, uh, you know, that I'd be back here and that they, they, you know, I would ever be, you know, an alumni fellow, which I know is a, you know, it's a tremendous honor. I will say though, just uh, uh, as an aside, I, I think I figured out uh, how this could happen. So we lived in 945 Sunset. Uh, there were a number of us that lived in this in a house a couple blocks from campus here. So it turns out and, and I, I thought of this when the uh, Alumni Association sent me a thing out said that there were only 310 or something, just into the 300s, mm -hmm. alumni fellows. And I'm going, wow, well, we're, you know, Nancy and I make up quite, you know, we're, we're a big, pretty big piece of that. And I got to thinking about it. So at 945 sunset, my roommate for uh, four years here, who's, a, uh, who's an architect, he was uh, selected as alumni fellow for the College of Architecture last year, Steve Henry, who's an alumni fellow here at the Veterinary College, we routinely studied at 945. And 
my wife, who uh, we mar got married, uh, you know, of course we dated for a couple years in school, she spent a lot of time at our place. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> three of us right there, well, yeah, actually four of us right there uh, in 945. So I'm thinking there's one of those crystal things there, you know, sort of. <laughs> a, I have no other, I, I have no other explanation for how it happened to me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, you know, I, I have, you know, my brother is a, is, is a, uh, uh, a veterinarian graduate here. His, he has two daughters who are graduate veterinarians here. Uh, one of the daughters is married to a guy who's an equine surgeon and uh, did not go to school here, but was on the faculty here. Uh, so I've got the whole veterinary thing going, you know, especially with a especially with a veterinary wife. And uh, yeah, it just goes to show you who would have thought. Uh, you know, I I, I uh, uh, when I talked about Dr. Epson, it's uh, it's interesting, and he I, I heard I've heard this from more than a number of people that uh, he has said in, in, in these alumni things that his two favorite classes were his first class that he taught when he got here in, you know, 50, whatever it was. And then it was our class in 72 because he said, those guys knew how to party. <laughs> <laughs> and they knew how to go to school. And, and, and uh, uh, that's one of the reasons that we were so fond of Dr. Upson. And uh, so, I, like I said, I've heard that from a number of people who have said it. So uh, it must be true. But, uh, yeah, we had a good time. It, you know, I have nothing but uh, great, uh, great memories of being here. And, uh, you know, obviously when I came back to work, I got it. You know, I worked here for 18 years. That's, you know, doesn't seem possible. And, uh, you know, you have to retire sometime. And... Uh, you know, I guess I, uh, I guess it was my time, but uh, yeah, it's great. And you know, it's great to know, uh, you know, Dr. Beckham. Uh, you might or might not know she, you know, she uh, uh, during our real hot zone years. Uh, Nancy gave a talk at Auburn when she was a graduate student there, and Dr. Beckham came up and said, "You know what? This that sounds like just what I'd want to do," and she. That's what she did. She came to USAMRID and worked at USAMRID uh, on high hazard pass stuff. So, you know, so, uh, and we have dozens of anecdotes about that, you know, like that. So uh, it's really, you know, it, it's, uh, it's great, uh, even, you know, even though it is reflected and even though it is uh, serendipity in a lot of ways, it's really, uh, it's, it's really good to be, uh, uh, you know, held up as role models in some ways, uh, but uh, hey, it is what it is, and it's and it, and uh, I think it's good. It's good for the profession, and it's good for us, and uh, uh, and it's 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 a tremendous honor to be uh, you know to be selected for this because I know it's not just everybody gets one. Well, your contributions and Nancy's as well in the area of animal biosecurity with the Veterinary Corps and the Army here at Kansas State are immense, and uh, you're to be heartily congratulated for this recognition, Jerry. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, thank you. He is the Alumni Fellow for the College of Veterinary Medicine 2017 and a 1972 graduate of the college, Dr. Jerry Jacks. <laughs>